Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. And from all of us to all of you, happy Thanksgiving. The best way to begin today's program is to talk turkey. In our case, we'll talk Vermont turkey. This holiday season, approximately 50,000 turkeys will be sold at farms and specialty food stores across the state. One of the longest operating turkey farms is run by the Adams family, who started their operation in Westford in 1984. As the family has grown, so too has the business. Let's hear from Philip Adams about turkey season. Our turkeys come in roughly the beginning of June, uh, getting into July, our, our birds will come in as, as little baby, little poults we call them. Um, they're roughly about three ounces the size of a little golf ball. Um, they're, they're adorable little birds. Um, we take them out of the box one by one and then they go right under the heater. They'll get a drink and they start running around. Um, and it's from that point forward, they, their feet hit the shavings that they're running around looking to get into mischief. Uh, there's one thing about turkeys is they're always, always looking to get into trouble. Um, they're just, they're a social animal. They, they like being around the people when we come into the barns to, to feed them and water them. And oftentimes they're underfoot, um, but it's, it makes you kind of slow down your process and you gotta, you gotta go slow, you gotta work at their pace. Um, they're, they are a very social bird. Um, they say they, they, they'll crowd right around you and it's, it's, it's rewarding. It's actually, you know, they, they're a very, they're one of the few animals that really show appreciation um, when you, you give them some fresh food or some fresh bedding, they're gonna they're gonna go right to that and start really checking it out. They make like a, this a happy chirp. You can tell when when they're they're checking something out. They're curious. They're happy. Um, so it's it's a good feeling to know that you can you made this animal feel good um, for their for their short life. We try to make it as stress free and as happy as possible. At about 12 weeks um, into the growing season, they're they're gonna hit roughly 12, 13 pounds, and then every week from there they they keep going up. So it's it can be kind of a dance when you have, we have a lot of birds and Thanksgiving's very much of a deadline, a, a crunch deadline that that's, that's the end date. So we need to make sure that you know, we're on our game to get the birds ready for, ready for sale at the sizes that people need. Um, it's not just a matter of hatching a bunch of 16 pounders and hatching some 20 pounders. It's, it's a dance. Uh, these birds are growing every, every day of the week um, and we need to make sure that we can fill the orders that people want, whether it's a 10 pound bird or if it's a 35 pound bird. We want to be able to produce that for you. They will try to peck at each other. They're, they're fairly inquisitive birds. So you have some toys that are Definitely. like hanging up for them to not be bored, I guess. Yeah, they're curious animals. They have great eyesight. Um, a lot of, you know, all turkeys in the wild especially, um, but these birds are, aren't very far removed and they have very good eyesight. And on those bright sunny days, They'll find a speck of dust or, or, or dirt or something and they'll, they'll investigate and they don't have hands to, to do it with so they do it with their mouth. And uh, so they'll, they'll peck away at each other and uh, the, the toys really help to give them something to do. So they don't look to each other, they're, they're looking for, the, for their toys. What's it like in the weeks leading up to Thanksgiving? It's controlled chaos leading up to Thanksgiving for sure. Um, it's, it's, it's a quick, a fast approaching deadline um, we got to get these, these birds done and we got to get the size, sizes that people have been requesting because orders come in as early as September, um, late August and before we're even processing birds. So we need to make sure that, you know, we're, we're able to satisfy what, what our customers want. That's what's most important is what our customers want. Um, so yeah, once, once we see birds that are approximately the size that we're ready to harvest, um, you know, they're at a good, a good size range, they got a good, good fat yield on them, um, we'll bring them up to the processing house and, you know, see where, they, see where they weigh out. And then, you know, we take a tally from there and see if, hey, we need to give them an extra week, an extra day, or we got to get them all done before the end of the week. Um, it's all... Every year is different, and because we're you know we're dealing with a live animal here that doesn't decide to stop at 10 pounds or decide to stop at 15 pounds, they're gonna they're in such a comfortable environment they're gonna keep growing. They're they're happy as can be to be sitting in the barn um, next to their food bin. Um, so it's, it's it can be kind of a, a chaotic, and then you know people getting orders in light and there's not enough light in the day. Um, it's it makes for a long day, but but it's rewarding. What makes a locally raised turkey different from a frozen turkey in a grocery store? I think what sets apart our Vermont birds is the 
the effort that we put forth into these birds. Uh, we put a lot of a lot of care um, into the well-being of this of this product. We may have a couple thousand turkeys, but on the large scheme of things, in, in other parts of the, the country, this is a, it's a backyard farm. The grain that we get, um, it's a high quality grain, you know, no antibiotics, you know, it's all vegetarian. It's a high quality food that these birds get. Um, the shavings, the bedding that they're on is, is local. Um, it's from a local lumber yard, uh, kiln dried shavings. Um, it keeps the bedding real fresh, keeps, keeps the birds dry. Um, and it, it just keeps the environment clean, keeps the air clean. So the size of your farm, the effort that gets put in, is that what makes a locally raised turkey cost more? It does. I, I think it does. We have a five-person team here on the farm. Um, it's safe to say that each one of us individually handles a single bird at least half a dozen times. So that's whether it's taking the little tiny pole out of the box and placing it on the shavings to grabbing that bird in the freezer and handing it over the counter to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of care, and especially you know small farm like us, it's uh, you know the two owners, Dave and Judy, are right there in every step of the process and have a handle on it, have eyes on everything, so nothing gets by. By the time Thanksgiving rolls around, are you done with turkeys? <laughs> no, we we love turkey. We don't eat turkey very much during the year, so uh, the th Thanksgiving is really special for us. It's kind of the uh, it's a celebration for sure. It's the culmination of a, a successful season. And yeah, we definitely, uh, we double down on turkey for sure. Uh, we'll, always, we'll always pick one out that's, that's nice, maybe even two, um, do them a couple ways. But you know, turkey is definitely the centerpiece at our table as well. Just know that you know, a lot of love went into that bird. And um, you know, we, want, we want you to smile when you take a bite and think, think of us next year. Our thanks to Adams Turkey Farm in Westford and to all the turkey farmers who provide us with fresh, locally grown birds. Along with the turkey, there may be other Vermont-grown foods on your Thanksgiving table, including butter, cheese, and milk that all come from Vermont's dairy farms. Across the Fence is thankful for all the hardworking dairy farmers, and we're giving a special shout out to the 2021 Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year, which is the McGarry Dairy in Enosburg Falls. We'll meet the family in just a moment, but to begin, here's the Vermont Secretary of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Congratulations to the McGarry family, the farmer of the year from the Green Mountain State. You've worked hard over the last few years on your land, taking care of your animals, and producing a wonderful dairy product for all of us. We congratulate you on all you've done for your community in Franklin County and Vermont. We also congratulate the other winners of the pasture program throughout New England for their work throughout the years, raising agriculture to a new level. Best of luck throughout the seasons, producing wonderful milk for Vermont and the region and the country. We appreciate your hard work and dedication that you've all done over the last few years. Congratulations, the Farmers of the Year. I'm Keith Silva, and this is McGarry Dairy in Enosburg Falls. The origin story of this farm begins as a University of Vermont Extension love story. Diane Cotalesa and Ed McGarry met when they worked for Extension in the 1980s. Me and Diane married in 87, and uh, in 89 we uh, rented a farm. After about four years, we felt we were in a position we could afford to buy a place. So we looked all over New York State and Vermont, and then this farm three miles up the road came up for sale. We ended up buying this one in 93. I was working full time, and up until we started milking cows, Ed was working full time. So we were pretty busy, and we knew where we wanted to go, and we had goals. But I mean, we were just so busy that we just kind of buckled down and did it. The McGarry's have built their business through planning, perseverance, and prudence. If you look around here, we aren't elaborate. If you see our parlor, I always laugh that uh, when we're done with it, I think the Smithsonian's gonna want it because it's so old. Museum piece or not, the family milks 115 cows in this parlor. That's small when compared to the average milking herd in Vermont, which numbers around 200 cows. The McGarry's are members of the Cabot Cooperative Creamery. But it's so nice to have Diane and Ed person. help out when needed, but it's Brian, the couple's youngest child, 
who runs the operation and is a partner in the farm business. He graduated a few years ago from Virginia Tech with a degree in dairy science. Brian has always wanted a farm. When people would come here, like relatives from the city, uh, my, my sister-in-laws and all would be like, God, Brian told me all about the farm. It was always a dream of mine. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten really into the, you know, number side of things too. Uh, how, how do we, how does day-to-day -day work? improve our numbers, improve our profitability, which also leads back to health of our cows. Healthy cows, and the milk they make, comes from high quality crops. The McGarry's cropping strategy has been to invest in land, not in equipment. The way it was done back in the uh, early 90s was most people had their own equipment and did their own cropping. Diane and I, whenever we penciled it out, even to buy a mower or something, we would just say, wow, that's a huge expense for a piece of equipment we're going to use a little, literally for seven, eight days out of the year, you know? And so we could never, felt we could never justify that sort of expense. Custom cropping allows the McGarry's to hire out all their needs when it comes to the manpower and machinery needed to plant, fertilize, and harvest. They work with Scott Magnin's custom service in St. Albans to manage the farm's 200 acres. The cropping has a lot of perks. It allows it frees us up to milk more cows more efficiently, so it keeps us busier year round. It also gets a more uniform feed. We're doing a cutting in a day, so the feed is the exact same throughout our bunk. So our cows have really even feed throughout the year. Hiring in a custom operator doesn't mean the McGarry's take a hands-off approach to managing their cropland. Quite the opposite. Working this way allows them to take advantage of the latest technology, like manure injection, and cutting-edge cropping strategies like no-till planting, cover cropping, and interseeding. All of which benefits the McGarry's, sure, but it's also about protecting natural resources. I take very seriously uh, the term steward of the land and steward of the animals. I guess we try and be considerate neighbors. It means being a good neighbor to everyone, you know, the worldwide, if you can believe it. Soil health is so important. Like, to me, your land is, is such a limited resource, you've got to take care of your land. Um, and anything you do to, to destroy your land, that takes years and years to, to recoup. You've just got to take care of what you've got and it pays on so many levels. Having better soil health, better crops, better feed for your cows, it's just such a win-win-win in so many levels. It actually uh, is more profitable. We've seen yield increases with less inputs. Um, we aren't using as many synthetic fertilizers, which take a lot of fossil fuels to produce. In fact, we have cut down on our synthetic fertilizers by about mm, I would guess eight tons a year, and we're using more of our nutrients that we have here and keeping them here without, you know, we aren't losing them to the air or worse water. The sod will cover the seed properly. Yeah. Jeff Sanders is an agronomy specialist with the UVM Extension. He works with the McGarry's and their custom operator to come up with a plan that is financially sound and environmentally conscious. The McGarry's have always been on board with being environmentally friendly farmers. To be doing it the right way and know you're doing it the right way uh, has a lot of value for the farming community and it also has a lot of value for the, the rest of the population at large. And, and it's important from a UVM perspective because uh, this is where we see the things that we teach and the things that we educate people uh, about hit, hit the ground. And th this is where it matters. It matters here. This is a beautiful no-till field of corn. It's been a long road. We figured a lot of stuff out over the last 10 years and now this is normal. 10 years ago, this was not normal. But as things evolve and get better, uh, we get better results. And they've been in it from the beginning, so uh, this is what we expect. It's not, we aren't amazed at this, this is what we expect. A reporter once asked a farmer if he had been farming all his life. The farmer smiled at the reporter and said, well, not all my life. According to the nonprofit American Farmland Trust, the average age of a Vermont dairy farmer is 57. 
Ed and Diane haven't farmed all their lives, but they've never stopped thinking about the future of their farm. Me and my wife have always felt we wanted to enjoy retirement. We've worked hard, we wanted to enjoy, so we've always tried to invest in retirement. And so when my son was pretty certain he wanted the farm, we were pretty set up for it as far as retirement. It was just a matter of going to the lawyers and getting it formalized. We hired a team of lawyers that each had their specialty, but they worked together. I don't want to say that we did this thing three years ago and now it's done. It's always evolving as things change, as Brian's been here longer, we'll probably tweak it and redo it some. I think the thing that makes transition most successful is interest in that incoming generation. Tony Kitsis works with the UVM Extension's Farm Viability Team to advise farmers during their farm transition. He also chairs the committee that selects the Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. The judges really like to see, is there enough family involvement to keep things going, moving forward? And if so, what is that next generation looking to do? To have the ability to take where the farm is now and say to themselves, I have a great opportunity with what I've just learned to take my family farm the next step forward. Brian has that desire. I think it's exciting because, uh, you know, it gives me an opportunity to continue something that we've grown up with and hopefully continue to excel at. My parents did a, excelled when they dairy farmed and I, hopefully I can continue that and do a good job moving forward. Continue to make changes like my parents did in the past that will keep this farm going for years to come. Makes me nervous because the dairy industry is tough, but you know I'm excited to take that challenge on too. Dairy farming is a discipline a constant rhythm of chores, crops, and cows. This award is a reason for the McGarry's to celebrate. It's also a reminder the work goes on, because that's dairy farming. I'll tell you, I read, I don't know how long ago, 20 years ago that by 2050, there'd only be, I think, no more than 50 farms in Vermont, and I thought it was crazy. But I'm beginning to believe that, and I'm hoping Brian can be one of those 50 farms, if that's what it comes down to. I remember thinking back to uh, when, when me and Diane first started, and uh, all the hard work. I guess it's just nice to be recognized for years of hard work and trying to do the right thing, you know. And what does it mean to be a dairy farm today? Oh, that's a difficult, difficult question. I don't know how to quite answer that. I mean, uh, I feel like I wear so many hats. One minute I'm helping Brian with the nutrient management plan, the next minute I'm milking, then I'm doing taxes. You have to be very flexible and adaptable and just change very quickly. And, and, and listen to people, listen to the people around you. You got to bring your A game almost every day, and that can be a challenge. You walk in today, you might do things different tomorrow. You might decide there's a better way based on research you find or whatever. Always try and stay on the cutting edge of the research. I, I'm honored, but I'm also, uh, I think there's a lot of room for improvement still. What began as an extension love story became a commitment to farming and continuing the family business. That's the McGarry family, the 2021 Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. In Enosburg Falls, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. It's never too early to nominate a farm for next year's award. You can put forward a nomination for the Dairy Farm of the Year by downloading the form at the website on your screen. In our nation's capital, it's become tradition for the president to pardon the Thanksgiving turkey. John F. Kennedy started the turkey pardon in 1963. The most famous presidential pardon in Vermont history did not involve a turkey. It was a pardon issued by President Abraham Lincoln in 1861 that saved the life of a Vermont man. Here's Civil War historian Howard Coffin with the story. Here east of Groton along Route 302, stands a monument to a man who was probably the most famous private in all the Civil War, William Scott. 
a member of the 3rd Vermont Regiment. He was 18 when he went off to war. Early on, the regiment was stationed outside Washington in Georgetown. He was on sentry duty, and they found him asleep. He was court-martialed for that, and he pleaded not guilty, but still. After deliberations, the court-martial sentenced him to death by firing squad. They brought him out a few days later with the regiment assembled, tied him to a post, and he expected to hear his death warrant read. He was ashen-faced and trembling when he heard the words that he had been pardoned. He became known as the Sleeping Sentinel, and he went back to duty. Abraham Lincoln was aware of his case. Appeals had been made to Lincoln to spare his life. Looking back at it all, and looking at some sources like Wheelock Vesey, who was on the court martial, it now seems there was a plot afoot to scare the daylights out of Union privates early in the war by almost killing one of them. Apparently it worked. Just south of St. Johnsbury, along the Pasumpsic River, down here where Interstates 91 and 93 now meet, that level area was once the St. Johnsbury Fairgrounds. To the fairgrounds in the summer of 1861 came a thousand Vermont men to drill and form the 3rd Vermont Regiment. One of those men was William Scott. The sparing of the sleeping Sentinel's life was big news. It was in all the newspapers. Scott was briefly famous. The winter passed in camp. Scott wrote home to Groton about how he wished he could be home and how he'd like some maple sugar. Then war began. George Brinton McClellan took his Army of the Potomac down the Virginia Peninsula and began to move against Richmond. But lo and behold, the Army came upon the Warwick River, which didn't show on their maps. It looked much like this orange pond. About this wide, it had been dammed by the Confederates, and on the far side, the Confederates had constructed earthworks, formidable earthworks and rifle pits. On the 16th of April, General McClellan came along and ordered the Vermonters to wade across that pond and attack those earthworks. The 3rd Vermont were the first to go, and as they waded into the water, William Scott was riddled with bullets. But they kept on across the pond, captured the earthworks, and held them until driven away by a Confederate counterattack. By the end of the day, 148 Vermonters had been shot. 65 of them would die. The war had really begun for Vermont. Vermont learned what war was all about. So the Vermonters had seen their first real heavy combat. Soon would come Savage's Station and bigger casualties. And down the road, of course, was Gettysburg and Wilderness and Cedar Creek and finally Petersburg and Appomattox. And the final cost would be some 6,000 Vermont lives. Right smack in the middle of Groton is the town Civil War Monument with an astonishing number of names of local lads who served in the Civil War. The Scott boys' names are on here. At the time of the Civil War, there was a store here. Local people gathered here to get the latest war news. I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Scott took the buckboard four miles down to get that news night after night. Was it here that he learned of William's death? Maybe Carl Sandburg said it best. 
William Scott, among the fresh growths and blooms of a Virginia springtime at Lee's Mills, took the burning messages of six bullets into his body. All he could give Lincoln or his country or his God was now given. Civil War combat had begun for the Vermonters. Thank you, Howard. And once again, thank you for joining us across the fence for this special half hour Thanksgiving program. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well and have a great day.